that part. Uh, that extra gear, that first three steps. Huge strides in the performance. That I might not be the player I am today. All right, welcome to another episode of Behind the Gear. And today we are sitting with uh, Steve Benedetti. And Steve, uh, I've had a chance to get to know you, obviously, bunch over the years um but uh kind of a real cool background obviously played minor hockey here in london and then um really got and played at a high level played a bit of pro played college or university which is you know obviously i always say you know when, when players every level you move up you kind of you you get to more to the top of that pyramid obviously we all want to play in the nhl which would be the peak of that uh, of that pyramid but not all of us get a chance to do that but you know playing junior is a big thing and then obviously getting to university i think is huge and then getting a chance to play a little bit of pro and making a little bit of money playing hockey is always Pretty cool. And then now, obviously, getting into the, even the app side of it, you know, kind of got into the tech side of, uh, of, the, of the business, I guess. And then now an entrepreneur starting kind of your own thing. So you've got a, a well-rounded uh, life after hockey, I guess, uh, kind of moving through the minor hockey Try throughout it. the ranks. Yeah. Try it. Yeah. No, it's great, <laughs> yeah, man. Absolutely. Um, so born and raised London, Ontario. And then where, where did, uh, where did you play your minor hockey? Yeah, born and raised here in town. Um, I guess we were the, played in London, played like uh, triple a, but we were the London, like it started as greater London, yeah. I guess. And then it kind of morphed over to, uh, what were we, the London rebels Okay, is what we cool. were. Cool. I'll just slide this up a little bit. Yeah. Oh, we had the big, we had the big, uh, Yosemite Sam. Oh, did you, yeah, 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 yeah. L. Yeah. Like oh, like a lot of our buddies have that tattoo, the Sammy Sam with the hockey stick. Yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah. So that's yeah, that was our generation. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so do, did that, and then uh, just yeah, basically in London the whole time, and then you know as junior hockey came, played you know started in Thamesford when I was fifteen. Yeah, um, so that was kind of my first taste. Actually, when I was bantam, played midget level hockey. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of, I've got my own take on like people playing up versus I think at that time it would have been better for me to stay with your age group and bantam instead of getting exceptional status and moving up. Yeah. Moving up in the <laughs> major world. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then just junior hockey, like in the area, like in Strathroy in London yeah. and then was fortunate enough to play for Western, which is kind of funny. Cause you talked on like, you know, the dream is to play certain levels of hockey. I think like maybe I didn't set that dream high enough, but like, you know, I always went to like sport Western and I always thought yeah. like, you know, Steve Ruchin was there and all these guys. And I was like, Oh, Western, like that's the place. Like that's where I want to play hockey. Type yeah. Of thing. So that's cool. Yeah. So, so you basically, kind of achieve that goal yeah like, i just didn't set the bar high enough. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you would have made the nhl yeah, if you set it probably, higher that's why never know yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is i, I already had yeah. it guys i'm good not I'm even good. close but yeah. yeah it's amazing like i don't think people realize how good cis hockey oh is. it's unreal like it's so fast and even yeah. today like you probably way faster than it was even when yeah. i played but like it's those guys don't get enough credit oh i almost like i always say it's one of the one of the best like kept secrets in hockey as far as the the, the level it's unbelievable like and, and you see like the the guys that are coming the guys that are coming out of the OHL and stuff and and junior hockey junior B junior A playing there the level of hockey is unreal like it's, oh, it's unbelievable and I think good. too like I mean you didn't grow up here but like the Knights weren't the big product then like yeah they were um, off the four hundred one in the old London Gardens or yeah. whatever it was and they didn't really have at least in my childhood like it wasn't like the Knights were amazing yeah you know they they really weren't until they moved downtown and I think like there's now been this like Knights effect. It's yeah. kind of like taken over around London and around the area. Like there's so many amazing talented hockey players just from this neck of the woods. And yeah. It has a lot to do with what happened here. Yeah, you know, it helps for sure. Yeah, for sure. I always the other thing too I notice is being you're right, I'm from northern Ontario. So moving down in this, you know, we had the Sudbury Wolves up there, which were hit and miss years, but that we had the same thing. Everyone had OHL eyes, everyone loved, you know, kind of the OHL. Yeah. Uh but down here too, you're I find that we're so close to even Detroit and Toronto. That when they, when they have good teams too, like right now I see Toronto obviously oh, having a good team, exciting team. You yeah. get it buzzes a little bit more with with the hockey and the Toronto Leaf Leafs fans coming out, and it's just everyone's a little more excited when the Leafs suck and are not <laughs> doing well. You get so many discouraged people oh. and just pissed off fans, right? Well, I see that with like my nephew's a huge Chicago Blackhawks fan. Yeah, it's because you know he grew up in the time where it was like Taves yeah. and Kane, and they were thriving. And yeah, it was, everything was Blackhawks, Blackhawks, and I'm like what a great time it would be to actually be a Leaf fan because you could see these guys play yeah. all of the time. There's so many talented players. Like, I mean, Marner's unbelievable. Yeah. That guy's just a yeah. special talent. I mean, like so many other guys with Nas and Tavares, yeah. all these guys. But just for like, you know, he's not getting a lot of Chicago games on TV. So I think like as a fan, like why not watch yeah. the product that's right here? Because yeah. they've got, you know, and they're building something and they're going to be sure. successful for a while. Yeah. They can stay together. Oh, definitely. Yeah. It's a, it's a fun, a real fun team to watch, man, for sure. Yeah. Um, growing up though, for you, I mean, knowing you, I, I mean, I mean, you, I think more in university when I was coaching with Western, which you ended up coaching at Western as well, a little bit with Clark, yeah. with Clark Singer. Um, what were some of the things growing up for you though, that you, 
that helped you separate? Because I know, you know, growing up, I'm, I'm going to assume you weren't always the best player on your team, always the top dog. You're probably why, one of the. Why would you assume that? Well, just because I, just because <laughs> I know you. Um, no, but I mean, like, you know, even playing up a year, obviously you were one of the top guys. But how did you, you know, as you're growing up, how did you kind of stay above the curve? And I know this kind of as an inside scoop, but I know that you're a hard worker. I know you worked out hard and trained hard. Um, mm-hmm. But what are some of the things that you, you know, kind of helped you separate? Because I mean, I played with guys that were way more talented than I was, that I ended up playing further than them probably just more on just sheer determination and, and work ethic, right? So what are some of the things that kind of separated you as you went through? Because you have guys drop off probably after midget, guys drop off after junior, and you kind of kept Yeah, kept you going. see, I mean, you see guys drop off all the time, and then, like, there's different, people are motivated by different things, right? And social takes people a certain way, and some people are a little more ingrained. And I think, like, as I got a little older, I got a little bit more passionate for yeah. hockey, and I just kind of, like, did a little bit more, that type of thing. But I had, like, uh, a cool experience in Strathroy, uh, Pat Stapleton was there, yeah. you know, so Pat was with the 72 Summit Series and he was really about, you know, preaching the mental side of the game. And before that, I had never really understood, you know, yeah. mental preparation. Like you just go to like our generation, you basically, there wasn't a lot of summer training. Like you right. put on your skates yeah. in September and then you went to the ice and then that's what you did. And then kind of like it really evolved over my like later years in junior and then through university. Um, so Pat would have been a good influence. And then like, as you know, like Jeff Hackett and I, um, you know, Jeff was playing for Montreal at the time and he was in London and I was an 18 year old kid. And I would say he had a massive influence on like kind of my direction in hockey because he, he basically taught me like what hard work was. Yeah. I thought that I knew what hard work was until yeah. I met Jeff and like, you know, Jeff, like he's, he's amazing. Yeah. He's insane Real good guy. in terms of like how hard he works. So I got to see that and then be around it all of the time That's and then cool. just kind of like pick his brain. So I think like that experience really taught me like okay here's what a pro is and he played 16 years right yeah. like a 16 year pro and this is what it takes and this is how hard he's working towards the end of his career you know like let's soak up as much knowledge as i possibly can and that's really kind of where i think that um kind of took off a little bit in yeah. terms of my development like that's why i, like, I love coaching like the 15 year old kids it was like man if i learned this when i was 15 instead of when i was 22 yeah type of thing like it passing been, some of that on yeah, right he, yeah he was a huge influence yeah for sure. No, that's cool. Um, would you agree, though, having a good support group around you guys like Hack? And I know you had some other guys around you that were kind of on the same page, that were pushing the same way. Having that support group around you of those people that are pushing a little bit and, and kind of, you know, motivating you in certain ways. I'm sure you motivated them in other ways. Uh, mm-hmm. How important was that as, as you're going through that in kind of 17, 18, 19 year old years? Yeah, I think surrounding yourself with the right people yeah. is like a big message to kind of, you know, I was fortunate enough that like a lot of my friends were athletes you yeah. know like maybe different sports but they were pursuing it so it wasn't like you know we're getting drawn in different directions um you know you think of maria mountain i think you had maria on yeah. as well like maria yeah. was a huge influence too like she trained jeff and i and like she was really about like the biomechanics and like different movements yeah and, like i used to get so frustrated with her i know jeff would you could those would be some funny <laughs> stories you should talk about but <laughs> like little movements and be like you know at the time you thought you wanted this like beach body workout type yeah. of thing but like she was really about like, she made me faster yeah. You know, just like working on like different aspects of like things like that. So again, it was just surrounding yourself with a different group of people. You know, like you mentioned Clark, like Clark yeah. gave me an opportunity at Western. I'm, you know, very thankful for that too. And then, yeah. you know, and then it just kind of like kicked off my hockey journey, which was, you know, everyone's got that kind of story. But for me, it was like, it was probably where I am today because of it. So Yeah, no, that's cool. Uh, and then you had an opportunity to go to Europe, right? So you went over to Europe to play. What was that like kind of <laughs> leaving college, leaving your kind of hometown that you played, you know, around and kind of lived, you know, at home or close to home for, for years and then going, you know, across the ditch over to, over yeah, to Europe. Awesome. And it was cool. I mean, like uh, my last year at Western ended up going to Arizona, like for that playoff yeah. type of thing. Cause we were finished and we didn't make it to nationals that year. Yeah. So I got a kind of first taste of pro hockey type of thing. And, um, that experience was awesome. And then a teammate of mine had actually signed a deal over in Europe. And he was like, hey, and we actually played together at Western. He's like, hey, do you want to come over? And I was like, oh, you know what? That's something I always thought about doing. I wasn't sure how that opportunity would come up. And then it it did. And then it went over there. I mean, the hockey is interesting. Yeah, you know, a little it's, different. It's a little different. I yeah. mean, it depends on what level you're at. There yeah. were some amazingly talented yeah. guys. And there were some other guys that, there you, go. you know, weren't quite as yeah. Talented. What are you doing? What are you doing over here? What's going on here? Yeah, there you go. Got it? Yeah, it's 99 cents on Amazon. Keep going. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Yeah. Um, 
it was it was funny though. So I got over there and like one of the first things, he's like, oh, he's like, I got this all figured out. He's like, you know, um, he's like, you just got to toe drag a couple guys, you know, do like something fancy. And he's like, then they'll want to sponsor you after the game. And then, yeah. you know, he'll put a piece of like, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> on your pants. Yeah. Something yeah. like that. Right. So, yeah. the, so the hockey to me was, it was a different experience. Like it wasn't yeah. the same structured like university game or what it was like, you know, afterwards, but it was, it was entertaining. The ice was bigger. So you got to like learn how to play a completely different yeah. type of hockey game than we're used to here. Just the skill level was right. something I had never really, it was just a completely different game. I don't yeah. even know how to describe it. Like um, yeah. just guys like, Every, everybody was trying to do individual things it wasn't as much structure it was just kind of wheel and deal and it was fast paced but it was it was just like it was more about the lifestyle for me yeah, just right. to kind of experience a different culture and like be in that type of the world and, I mean you and I talked earlier about like the language barrier yeah you know I get off on this airplane and I think that everybody can speak English and every sign is not in English yeah <laughs> you yeah. know and so you're just trying to yeah. navigate your way through the world that yeah. type of thing so um, the experience was unbelievable just to kind of see a different culture and travel the world and yeah I'm very fortunate I got to do that no that's awesome man I think the mics are picking up okay I think it might be just our uh, yeah, what is it? headphones I don't know a little bit static in here um, is it your first time? yeah seriously I've never had to do this before sorry I'll have to edit that out um, we'll keep going and just see so how like it, uh, it, it plays out. Signal, I don't know. Maybe we'll see. Um, whereabouts in Europe were you? I was in Holland. Okay. Yeah. So it was a city cool. called Nijmegen, yeah. which was uh, about forty-five minutes from Amsterdam. We were right on the German border. It was funny. We had an American on our team, and I don't know the whole story, but you know, during the war, I think there was some friendly fire. On oh really? The, the city of Nijmegen by the Americans. So yeah. this American guy, you'd always wear like a flag on your helmet to represent what country you're from. Yeah. He used to get booed by the home fans. No way. All the time. Yeah. It was pretty oh, that's brutal. How did he take it? Was he rattled the water? Or was uh, he was back? clueless. This was guy. He? So yeah, he didn't care. But it was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah. Um, and then after that, what what ended up happening after that? Then did you end up coming back? Back ended, home after that? Yeah, I ended up coming back after that. Uh, I would have been 28, I yeah. think, at the time. And then, um, actually, it was right around the same time Hack retired. Okay. And he had, you know, two young boys, Montana and Curtis. Yeah. And they were playing hockey. And Hack's like, hey, do you want to coach? And here I am coming out of hockey. I feel like I know everything about it now. Yeah. So, yeah, sure, I should coach. But you learn a lot. For sure. As you get into the coaching world. Yeah. So, I mean, it was pretty cool. So, Hack and I coached uh, both his boys. So, we're kind of getting, like, instead of doing one team a season, was doing two. You know, so you kind of yeah, got like right. a little bit of extra, yeah. another experience. A little bit of a book. full-time job. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. Yeah, yeah, especially with Jeff. So it was yeah. like, it was a good way to kind of dive into it. How many he, phone calls a day about like practice and that drills? Time, and... Yeah, there's a lot of hockey talk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But he was, I think like he was coming from uh, Colorado. He was the goalie coach. That's right. Right. So he had kind of already been in that yeah. environment too as a coach. But it, I mean, it was awesome. So we worked with like, we had the North London team at the time. Yeah. I don't think there's a lot of teams running power plays or different right. like face off plays like we were doing. But yeah. it was it was fun to kind of see um just the success. Like see the boys actually have success and do things and kind yeah. of like get on a different side of hockey, which is yeah, it's kind of my first taste at coaching and I loved it. That's all no, it's great, man. And then from there, I mean coming out of like that kind of A double A loop with it with, with the boys. Um, you know, then you kind of jumped into the AAA minor midget, which is a little bit of a cesspool of hockey as far as that's the, you know, you always talk about minor hockey and, and how important it is, how fun it is, but really everyone's playing, especially the AA, AAA, everyone's playing to that minor midget year in this, in this area, because that's the OHL draft. That's kind of the first milestone, the first kind of where parents get a chance to, you know, boast about their kids as far as getting drafted or not getting drafted or things like that. So sure. being involved in that, at that level. Was there anything that kind of shocked you when you got into the minor midget and, and started coaching? I'm sure you heard all the nightmares. Oh, it's going to be a tough year. It's a hard. Yeah. Every parent group becomes a little bit different at that age group because you love your kid and you want to see your kid do well and you want what's best for your kid. But was there anything that kind of stood out to you that, man, I didn't expect it to be like this? I don't know. I think that, like, uh, hockey's a little bit crazy anyway. I think because you're, we're from Canada that, like, even my grandma's an expert, you know, that yeah. type of thing. Like, everybody knows everything about yeah. hockey. So it's like we live in that little universe. Um, I don't think that I was totally prepared for what the minor midget year was really all about. I just thought like, you know what, I'm having fun coaching. I think that I can offer a lot of value to like this type of age of player, yeah. um, through my experiences and different things. I just thought like it was a really good age group to work with. It's really my whole sure. approach to the whole thing. It yeah. really wasn't about 
the noise of the politics that's involved with it. And so I think I always kind of took that approach of just like, here's the, what you need to learn at 15 to make you successful at 18, 19. And yeah. kind of always stuck with that. And you really got to manage all of the BS that goes around it. Like, you know, yeah. like there's so many like Twitter feeds out there that are ranking these kids and then moms and dads, like you said, it's like a pissing contest. Like, well, my yeah. kid's better. And then like, it really like, it can infiltrate your team and then really players start playing like as individuals instead of a team. And like, it's, the draft year is crazy to me. Like, I just don't think that it matters. Yeah. To be honest with you, unless you're, you know, Suzuki or Addy, who's going in the first round. I mean, yeah. like, those guys, but you can watch. I think like now you could go to any minor midget tournament. You could probably pick out the top forty kids for sure pretty quickly. Yeah. And then it's like, where do you take that kid? How does he fit in your lineup? And you know, but there's a lot of guys that maybe aren't there at fifteen that you know develop and they're going to be great at eighteen. And I think that sometimes people lose that in the draft year because they think it's all about where you get taken. I mean, like look at Willie Lahad. Like Willie Lahad, that kid should have got drafted. Yeah, he was undrafted. For whatever reason, I have no idea. Yep. I mean, I would have drafted him. Um, no, for sure. But then you see him now, and he's you know he's having success with London, and yeah. like, the kid works his tail off. Yeah, like, it's unbelievable. So, I just think there's so many guys that go drafted really high that don't end up doing anything, and there's guys that never get drafted that end up. So it's like to me, it's a marathon approach anyway. And people are so short sighted on this minor midget year, and this is going to be the be all and end all of everything. And I think if you kind of took that pressure away and just had a different mindset then you probably have success but yeah parents just get swallowed up in it and it's but you can't well, manage it it's no you're right and going back to what you had like he's obviously we both know him well he's a great kid but it's a kind of a fun it's kind of an interesting story because yeah he should have been drafted wasn't drafted to the ohl uh, i remember mom and dad being a little bit obviously upset just like any parent would be sure. uh, but upset to the point where they're like this was maybe this was a big waste of money. You know, maybe this whole process was just a big waste of time, waste of money. Yeah. Um, but Willie didn't have that mindset. I remember talking to Willie after the draft, and yeah, he was upset a bit, but he's like, you know what, I'm gonna keep working. And then then he got an opportunity at Niagara, and then he ended up playing. Then he ended up being a regular, and I always got schooling paid for. Like yeah. he ended up being a guy who came in the back door maybe a little bit, but never stopped working right. and that didn't get drafted and is playing above. Yeah. 90% of that draft, right? And now he's got an opportunity, you know, with the Knights to maybe go on a bit of a run on his, in his last year. And then if he decides to go play pro or go to school, he's covered off in school. I mean, it's, an, it's a cool story, but it's one of those things where if the kid likes it, at 15, 16, I mean, how, you know, yeah. they have so much more growing, so much more maturing to do. It's it's a young age to get drafted or not get drafted, but at the same time, it's not over. No, and like you, know? you see some guys at 15, they look like they're 25. Yeah. You know, and then you get another kid who looks like he's 10. Yeah. You know? And so, and then like a lot of it has to do like, how big is the family? You know, like For sure. maybe there's other outside factors that have nothing to do. And I mean, I think guys like Mitch Marner and Kane are like changing that mold. Like you're seeing yeah. like Goudreau, like you have these amazingly talented young guys that are you know tiny but yeah they're the can best play. guys in the league yeah right? so for like, sure so I think that maybe takes the stigma away like it's not yeah. like back in the day when you had to be six foot eight yeah um, to really kind of play it's a different game it's more skilled so kids yeah. are getting an opportunity but like to your point like you're, you're bang on there I think there's just that whole mindset I'm not sure what happens between Bantam and minor midget or even like <laughs> my nephews and peewee right I know that age group's talking about their draft year when they come to draft year yeah. like you know it's four years away like, yeah like, why don't we focus on the present and just kind of continue to get better and evolve I don't yeah. know why it has like we never had a draft year kind of like that where everybody was in minor midget I don't remember it being when I was young I mean it was a long time ago but I don't remember it being I don't remember the pressure being on like that. I remember talking about the draft and remember knowing about the draft and never, I, I remember being, you know, part of that whole, co you know, conversation. Um, I always joked that if somebody drafted me, they probably should have got fired. Like I was nowhere near ready for the <laughs> OHL at 16 or 17 yeah. or whatever it was. Yeah, right. I but, didn't even know what it was. And my parents weren't into it. My parents weren't like politically involved or anything like that. So I, I really, you know, I was, I remember being a little bit upset that I didn't get a sniff or like that. And buddies of mine got drafted and like everybody that I thought I was better than or whatever sure. at that point. But Looking back on it now, I can, you know, honestly say I'm glad I didn't get drafted. It, it you know, made me maybe work harder or maybe put an extra little thorn on my side that I was sure. pissed off. Um, mm. But I, I also think a lot of these, a lot of this stuff that, that we see as, as coaches or parents now, all those little obstacles that overcome, like, let's say you don't get drafted. Well, how does that family deal with it? Yeah. Right. Is it? this guy's fault because he's sewered you. Is it that guy's fault because his dad goes golfing with that guy? That's why he got dropped. No, it's, right. you weren't good enough. Maybe. You weren't one of the, and that's okay. That, yeah. That's, you know, how do you get better? Yeah, I think right? like and, I have this whole, you know, victim approach analogy. And I think, I think a lot of people more like 90% of people, unfortunately have this like victim mentality. Yeah. Like it's always somebody else's fault. 
you know, like, oh, I'm not in this situation because the coach doesn't like me or this. You know, like you usually get in situations because you're trusted and you kind of execute and you do what you're supposed to do. That's yeah. it. Like, you want to give everybody an opportunity. I think when it comes to the draft, same thing. Like, if I don't get drafted, well, it's this buddy. It's this person's fault yeah. that this happened. But it's really about, like, how much time did you put in? Like, yeah. did you really do that much more above and beyond everybody else? Like, I think that, I think the people that, there's certainly people that fall through the cracks, you know, but like, you know, if we're talking about Willie Lahad, he should have been drafted. He wasn't like a kid that just, you know, came out of yeah. nowhere and he just worked hard and all of a sudden he was good. Like he should have got drafted. I mean, yeah, it just, it just depends on, but that whole victim mentality I think is the wrong mindset and everybody has it. It's just yeah. not everybody, but my experience with, you know, and I've been fortunate enough to coach some really talented people. They don't have that approach. You know, and maybe because they're more elite, however, but I think that they come from really good families. They come from positive families. They, like the kids, like they're a sponge. Like I've worked with some kids that are, you know, how am I going to tell Nick Suzuki how to play hockey or Ryan Suzuki yeah. how to play hockey? But they they come to you and they're like sponges and they're asking you questions and how can I do this and how can I do that? And then you'll get another kid who's not very good. And who thinks he's yeah. the best player in the world and he's just a closed door. Like it's like you try to tell him something. Like a good example, like one of the kids I loved coaching was Justin Murray mm -hmm. playing for Saginaw. Yeah. He was Barry's captain, he just got traded in, yeah. the, in the winter there. But like he was he wasn't our best player in minor midget and like he was good, mm -hmm. you know, but he he just took off. And he was that kid, like after every practice would be like, What do I gotta do to get better? And yeah. I remember saying to him like <laughs> everything you yeah know, like do you really want to hear it and he's like yeah like <laughs> yeah. Tell, me, tell me the truth <laughs> yeah and then he was like he was the first kid on the ice last guy to leave you know he just like he worked and yeah. just wanted to get better and wanted to get better and you saw it you know like I think that's a kid like I'd be shocked if he doesn't get an opportunity like I know he hasn't been to a camp yet but to me like that kid yeah. is tough to play against like yeah. he's a great teammate so it's just but you see it like came from a really good family good kid was hungry never played that victim mentality like yeah. kind of, he worked for everything he got which is like I like those stories for sure. And sometimes it comes, like you said, sometimes it comes maybe a little bit easier for that athletic hockey player or that, you know, the player that is good, right? Yeah. But you look at some of these high end, most of the high end players that we've had a chance to work with, you get the odd few that kind of go through that are just good and don't work that hard and just are very talented. That's kind of your, your kind of outlier a little yeah. bit. But the, the crux of them, they want to get better. They want to be on the ice. They want feedback. They want to work on skills. They want to work on their skating and that boring, mundane stuff. They want to get better at that stuff, right? Yeah. And, I think when you get those kind of kids, it's refreshing as a coach because you're like, man, that's what I want to work with, right? And there are a lot of other kids that don't listen, that, that think they already know it. Maybe mom and dad are telling them in the car, you're already good enough. Don't worry. It's going to be fine, you know? Yeah, and yeah those I, are, think, like, I think coaching like 18 orphans would be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think that like, yeah. the challenge was like you get them for an hour and a half a day. Yeah. And then you're trying to preach a message, but then you know like when you when they get in the car with mom and dad, it's like, well, Billy sucks or this yeah. guy sucks or whatever. And then like you're just like planting these seeds in their head and it's like tearing your team apart. And you're just like, well, we just spent an hour and a half focusing on like we need to work together. If yeah. we work together, then individually you'll all have more success. That's the way it works. Like yeah. our 2001 group is a perfect example of like the ultimate team. Like those kids were, I mean, like just tons of kids having yeah. success off of that team. Um, they could have been, you know, complaining over ice time and that type of thing, but they were a team. And then I think because they were so close, like to me, that's the poster of what a minor hockey team should be like from the parents to the kids. Yeah. And I haven't seen that before. Like that, there was a reason why they were so successful, but they all pushed each other. The parents all got along. It wasn't this big, like yeah. competition. This kid's getting that, this kid's getting that. And like, I think if more people model themselves off of a team like that, you'd see way more success. Yeah, no, I know. I totally agree. And that age group, I've, we've been fortunate to work with them as well, as well, as well as you. Um, but they're, they're a tight group. Yeah, you know, it was one, 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 one or two kids have success early. The rest of them are like, yeah, it's great. That's great. And then now, now you see more of them having success, more of them getting a chance to play. There's a bunch of them playing junior hockey, a bunch of them playing in the OHL now. And, yeah. you know, hopefully they continue on. But even a guy like, you know, you look at Murray, who maybe hasn't gone to an NHL camp yet, but I, in, you know, his hockey future, I see a lot more hockey available to him. Oh, Whether he sure. goes to CIS, university hockey, whatever it is, right? Yeah. He's going to be playing a lot longer and then maybe go play professionally after that or who knows what happens. Yeah, but exactly. um, he's a guy who I don't think he's even probably reached his ceiling yet. You know, he keeps working hard. He keeps doing the right things. He's going to keep getting better. And that's, you know, we see young kids at minor midget that almost plateau. They almost hit that they're almost peaked out yeah. and they're not going to get much better from that point, whether it's mentally or physically or whatever it is. Sure. Um, and then you see other kids that maybe are, you know, a third line player or someone that's maybe not that top, top player, but you're like, that kid's got potential, man. Give him a couple more years and he'll be, you know, he'll be 
meeting those guys or you know playing against those guys or being at that at that level or, or yeah. surpassing those other players. Well, you even know? like a good example for us, like Alex Turco that's playing yeah. for the Knights right now. Like Turks was, he wasn't our best player on that '99 team, right? We had Ratcliffe and Suzuki. Mm-hmm. Vinogradov at the time was yeah, like he was phenomenal. Yeah, um, but Turks just got it. Like he yeah. was just a guy that like he knew that he wasn't going to be Connor McDavid. He didn't try to be Connor McDavid. Yeah. He was like, I'm going to be like the ultimate team guy. I'm going to block shots on a PK. Like, I'm going to win face offs. Like, he got all the little details of the game. And to me, there's a reason why that kid's having success because he was detail oriented. It wasn't about like the flash and flare because I watched Sportsnet and I got to do this toe drag. Yeah. Like, he actually played the game the right way. And so, you know, when you when you talk on talent, like, you know, Turks probably doesn't want me saying this, but like, you know, he wasn't the most talented kid we've ever coached, but like, he had he had everything it took to be successful. Yeah. You know, and I think if more kids had his attitude or his mindset, you'd actually see them go a lot further than where they go. And another, one other thing with Turk, I think that's really important is he's embraced the role that he plays, you know, and I, I was like that. I was an underskilled player who could skate and block shots and play the team game. And, you know, yeah. um, but when I embrace the role that, you know what, I'm going to be a penalty kill guy. I'm going to be a, a real good shutdown guy. I'm going to be a good face off player, win draws, things like that. Turk's done that, and now you see it. Like he's getting nice. He's playing a lot. Last couple of years, he's played a ton. He's a real key cog in that in that letter awesome. nights, you know. But he's embraced that role, and it's hard sometimes because let's say you have a player like that, but they think they're a first line player or a power play player, and then it, you're battling with them constantly. You they're going to cheat. Get that they're going to in, in minor hockey. It's crazy, like, right? That's what you get. So you if know. they embrace that early, your coaches can send that message to them. How nice is that? Right? Yeah, I think so. And I mean, like, there's a fine line, right? Because you don't want to just like pigeonhole yeah. a player and be like, you know, you're a fourth liner, you're a third liner, this is the type of player you're supposed to be. Because I'm I'm all about like being creative, and, yeah. You know that type of mindset and like you know not throwing the puck away and like you know because I think kids now are so afraid of making a mistake. Like you don't want to preach that message. Yeah. Either. And there's so much systems now that which is the way hockey's going at a higher level. But like at a young age, like if you don't know how to make a breakout pass and your, your go-to move is to go off the glass and out, then like you're not really evolving as a hockey player. Yeah, right. So I think sure. that that's just the thing with guys and, and he just, he just gets it. Yeah. So, but yeah, I'm not about pigeonholing anybody into any certain way, but you got to kind of know your limitations. Like yeah. you should be honest with yourself. We always used to talk to the kids and be like, you know, what is a player that you feel that you play like? Yeah. And I would say like, listen, no one can pick Crosby or Ovechkin. Right. Because I'm like, <laughs> yeah. he's just not in here. Yeah. Um, but you would get like back, like, Patrick Kane, um, yeah, Drew Doughty, or yeah. whatever it was, and I'm like, guys, no, like I hate to say that. Maybe one day, maybe one day, yeah, I hope yeah. that you, you're that guy. But no, we don't have that. And then just to get them to watch hockey and look at like what a third line guy does, like what does he do? What makes him successful? How does he get there? Yeah, you know, look at the little details of the game. Don't focus so much on like the Sidney Crosby of the world because. I haven't seen one yet to come out of any minor midget yeah. program I've coached. I no. mean, we've had some amazing kids, and I don't yeah. want to say anything bad about those guys, but they're they have their own style, you yeah. know, and they they play a certain way. So, I think it's just about like understanding the details of the game that'll make you, you know, more successful as a player rather than yeah. just focus on those crazy. No, it makes total sense. One other part of the game I think that's becoming obviously way more relevant in the last ten years and talking a lot more about it is the mental part of the game. And you and I touched on it earlier before we started recording, but. Um, is how these young players, are they mentally tough enough to play at that next level? That's the one thing I find now. We see a lot more skilled kids coming out at the younger ages, like Adams and Pee Wees are crazy skilled. And one of my questions is, okay, that's great, and they're way more skilled than the players that, that are playing older ages now. Um, mm. But what are they going to be like mentally when they get to that Bantam and that Midget? Because what we're seeing a lot more at the younger ages, I find, is parents making decisions, parents talking for the kids, parents you know, dealing with obstacles for the kids rather than letting the kids go through that stuff. So what are they going to be like mentally? Right. Um, And if if you want to touch a little bit on that, like is, as far as looking at some of the high end players that you worked with or kids, you know, some of the players that have moved on, whether it's high end, low end, doesn't matter, but they're played on. uh, What are some of the mental things that you've seen over the last bunch of years, as far as, you know, differences between some of these kids and and, kind of what helps? I think a lot of it just comes from home, right? I think that's like the the main message, but like confidence is like, we were talking about confidence. Confidence is such a crazy skill in itself, like believing in yourself. And I know like, it's kind of weird to say, but like I took this from when I, my time at Western, we were like the number one team in the country for several years. Guys would come to the rink just knowing we were going to win. Like yeah. that was your mindset. Like, that it swagger, it wasn't, right? It wasn't cocky. Yeah. It was just like, you know, we're going to win today. Like, and I was like, you know, what are we going to win by? You just kind of had that yeah. mentality kind of going into a game. And it was just kind of like 
changing your mindset even more. And you try to preach that to these kids on like just that mental side. But I think like, it's funny, like, I don't know if something happens when they're younger and it's like, everything's fair play and everybody, like there's no scoreboard or anything like that. And everybody like, I'm not sure that that's helping yeah. anybody. Like, I think there needs to be competition. I think it's okay to lose. I think you need to learn how to lose, you know? So if you're just going through something and everything's fair play and everybody wins, well, then you're not really driving that competitive edge or kind of going through yeah. that route. So I think like, I've seen it with kids where I just, like, we talked about this whole victim mentality. I think you got to squash that. Like, I think if you always have this victim mentality, then it's not going to fly and you're not going to go very far. Yeah. Right. And I think like these people think minor hockey's tough. Like wait till you play for, you know, some of these yeah. guys that are running junior teams yeah. when you get to the NHL, like it's a business. So yeah. like, you can't play like, Oh, poor me. Or I didn't get this opportunity. So I think like if you can squash it at a young age, um, my advice would be to do it as fast as you possibly can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just think that, yeah. I mean, like uh, we were talking about, I was at my nephew's hockey game recently and they were playing Brantford. He's got some unbelievable young kids are playing peewee, but the crowd is like yelling at these kids, like you suck and move the puck and shoot the puck. And it's like, you've got, I don't know how many people are at the game, maybe 80 people, but everybody's an expert telling these kids how to yeah. play. And it's just like, calm down. Like, yeah. just let, it's a game. Like, let them play the game. And let they're them, kids, let right? Let them figure it out. Like, yeah. it's kids. And there's so much pressure, like, at a young age because, and I think, like, even with us living in London, like, we've had this, like, Knights effect, like we were talking about. Everybody wants to get drafted because we have the Knights in town. Like, I think, like, a kid in London, you ask him what his dream is. Like, it's probably not to play for the Leafs. Like, it's probably that he wants to play for the Knights. Like, yeah. And that was the thing with the our OHL draft year kids. Like, that's why it's so important to these kids. They want to get drafted because this is, like, this is what they've been playing for is that, yeah. is that draft. So. The whole thing, like when it comes to the mental side of the game, I think it's drastically important to really focus on it. I don't have kids, so I yeah. can't really like speak to that whole side of raising somebody and kind of going through that process. But, you know, I look at my nephew who's coming up and it's just, we talked about confidence and different things like that. Like, I think you need to instill confidence in people. I yeah. think you need to let them believe in themselves and not like create that doubt. Like we always talk about with guys, like don't play with question marks. That's what we used to tell our guys. Like, if you have an issue or you have, like, hey, do you not like when I, like, just come talk to me. You yeah. Know? And, like, let's talk it out. And I think it's difficult for a 15-year-old to come and talk to you. And we try to have that open-door policy, like, you know, like, if you're going to work and you don't know if your boss likes you or if this person's going, then just talk it out. Like, yeah. just communicate. To me, like, the, the, the simplest way to have, like, results is just communicate. You yeah. Know? So just don't, and I think, like, people just play games in their mind make things up that really aren't really happening or make things seem worse than they are. So just like talk it out, but be positive and have that kind of mindset, but work hard. Yeah. Like the people that work hard are the people that flourish. Well, and I think more than just sport too, I think it's life, right? That whole, that, that whole victim mentality. If you take that into the workplace, garbage, you're not going to last very long. You're not going to be very well liked. Right. And I think, Creating like you know, I'm I'm a I'm a young young. Well, I'm old, but my kids are young. <laughs> yeah, what? <laughs> yeah, uh, but you know, I'm just starting out with my kids. But I think you know, I think it starts with parents at a young age to instill that confidence, and also that take away that victim mentality. Like if yeah. something happens, well, you caused this to happen. I know you're five years old, but that this is why it happened. This is what you did, um, and having them do things like, for instance, we were really big, my wife and I on them having conversations with adults. We just started this new thing at dinner where you got to ask three questions about how someone's day was. Love that. Right? Rather than just like, you know, you talk to a five-year-old, it's like talking to this table sometimes, right? <laughs> so forcing them to be, you know, a little bit more, you know, communicative and things like that. We right. were at, um, we went to the mall the other day and my my son and I, six years old, just sitting down having a, I was having a coffee, he's having a snack and he wanted a water. I'm like, okay, well, here's $5. Go grab a water at the counter. So I could see him. He went up, he grabs a water bottle. I looked, look, look, like water for me. I don't know. He looked at it, grabbed it. He's like that. I'm like, yep. So he goes up the counter, gives I'm like, make sure you say please and thank you. He gives a girl the money. I could see him. He's like, thank you. Grabs the money, comes back, yeah. sits down. I'm like, awesome, buddy. Good job. That was yeah, great. You did a really good sure. job. Yeah. Well, it was carbonated water. He hates carbonated water. <laughs> <laughs> so he's pissed now. Yeah, of course. So he opens it and I can see the fuzz. He's like, I'm like, buddy, I think this is carbonated. Yeah. He's like, and then he's like, Mur. I guess. So I'm like, Victim. buddy, you, you, you picked, well, dad, you said it was okay. I'm like, I can't read from over there. <laughs> So you, gotta, so you end up having some drinks of it and like quench this thirst. I'm like, you messed up. I'm, I'll take part of the blame for that because you can't read very well yet. Right. But I'm like, <laughs> it, it is what it is, buddy. Like yeah. that, you know, so we're not going to get another water. You're, and he drank it. And, but it's like, 
all those little things, I think saying no, uh, you know, to your kid, it's not easy. It's way easier to just go buy another water. It's fine. I'll drink this one. You get an, like, no, this is life, man. Sometimes stuff happens. You roll with it. You figure it out. You don't like what happened for dinner. That's what happened for dinner. So you're going to figure out how to eat it. Yeah. You know, like teach, teach accountability. Yeah. And I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not saying I'm, I'm, the, I'm parenting the right way, but just trying to like almost bring in some of that old school stuff that we were raised with a little bit. Yeah, I agree. And cause it is way easier, man, when you have kids and they're at Walmart and they're breaking down because you're not buying them that bouncy ball that they want. And it's way easier to just buy the bouncy ball and leave. Yeah. Right. It's way harder to say no and have them scream and all the way to the car. And, you know, but if you start that stuff at a young age, it gets easier and easier and easier as you get going. And hopefully, you know, the hope for myself and my wife and stuff is that down the road, they'll be able to deal with stuff on their own a little bit easier and be able to manage a little bit easier, you know, and, yeah. and kind of go through that stuff. And for, I know for you, even coaching that, you know, the minor, you know, minor midget, they're 15, 16. I mean, at the end of the day, for me working with kids and athletes and stuff and my own kids, I just want good human beings at the end of the day. Yeah. If they, if these minor midget kids or these OHL kids don't ever play in the NHL, that's, that's okay. Yeah. Maybe they come back and they do something like you're doing. They're an entrepreneur or they're coaching or they're doing skill stuff, whatever it is. Right. But just being good people. And, yeah. And you I know, think like, I think that's really the message that should get laid out there. I mean, like obviously playing the NHL would be amazing. For right? sure. For yeah. These kids. For that's sure. great that they have a goal and they have a dream. But like, I guess the thing that I don't really understand, and you see this probably with your business is, you know, like people are so focused on, Hockey, 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 hockey. Hockey's everything. Like, there's no emphasis on math or science or, like, how's my kid doing in school? Like, yeah. maybe they're like that. I don't see that. But it's, like, everything's hockey. And, like, I got to have three A's on my jacket because then it's, like, way better than those double A people. Or yeah. Whatever that whole crazy mentality is. I just don't quite understand it. Yeah. Um I don't even know where I was freaking going with that. No, but I, I think, like, like to your point, I think, you know, sometimes we put the emphasis on the wrong things. Yeah. Like, you got to do all, like, it, it happens all the time. Like, kids maybe miss school because they're sick. They go to the game at night. That doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. If you're good enough for the game, then you should be go, at least go half a day at school, right? Or, you know, but putting the emphasis on the right things. And I think, like, going back to schooling, I think, at the end of the day, for us, I know, like, with the academies run, things like that, school's number one. If you're missing assignments and you're not going to school, you're not coming on the ice. You're not yeah. working out. You need to focus on that first. I, I you just know? don't understand why the dream is the NHL. You know, I yeah. think it's awesome to have a goal and set that goal and like go after it. But that's what I was saying is like, there's so many people that don't make the NHL that are super talented at hockey. For right? sure. Like it, there's a little bit of like luck and opportunity that kind of gets there. Cause like, I mean, you've seen these guys Definitely. the American League, like they're amazing. Guys in the coast, they're amazing. These young, young guys coming up, they're amazing. There's so many talented players in the world. And I think we just put this major focus on like, you're going to be a hockey player. And then you're defined from the time you're five, you're 25, you're a hockey player. And then what? Yeah. Like, then there's like, what do I fall back on? Like, what do I do? Like, you know, did I, yeah. did I take school seriously? And you know what that locker room mentality is like, you know, like everybody's macho, everybody's a hockey player. I think it's kind of changing depending on the certain ages. But for me, it was never about like, you know, these kids are the best. Like, there's some kids that we coach that, you know, have gone on to do amazing things in school. Like, you just want to see, like yeah. you said, like good people that are like, that want to learn or want to, I think there's more lessons to be learn from hockey than just like how you run a power play or a PK. Like it's about like working with a group of people, like communicating with people to try and achieve a goal together. Like there's so many life lessons that you take oh, from just being sure. a hockey player than just, yeah. do I get drafted and will I play in the NHL? Like to yeah. me, there's just so much more to it than just this specific little goal that people have in mind. And I think every, I think any sport is like that, right? It, whether it's individual sport or a group sport, but I agree. I think, being a team player in a, in a work environment, working with the team at work. I think yeah. that's, that's huge. Right. And just being a good person, man, being someone that can be accountable. Hey, yeah. I messed up. It's my fault. You yeah. know, that was Which my is mess. Tougher right. To find now, I think a hundred percent. Yeah, for sure. And I think, again, I think that starts with, you know, parents, I think parent, keeping your kids accountable. Yeah, don't parents, make excuses for your kids. Parents are going to hate us after this podcast. Oh, it's but. all right. They already hate us. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, for me for sure. Yeah. For but I think like even for myself, like I'm a young parent, but there's a lot of times I got to look in the mirror and be like, I messed that one up. Like I didn't, I didn't deal with that the right way. You know, maybe I was too hard on my kid. Maybe I yelled at my kid. Maybe I snapped yeah. or, you know, maybe yeah. I was too soft, whatever it is. Like you're always self-evaluating, I think as a parent, as a coach, you know? Well, I think as soon as you like close your mind, then you're done. Yeah. You know, I think that like, you know, maybe you're the best at what you do, but if you stay like this, someone's going to pass you. Right. So yeah. it's just like, be open, like be open to influence. And I know like when we took that high performance coaching thing, um, it was really about sharing information. Like that yeah. was the big thing. Like let's share information. And I know like when I coach minor midget, like there was coaches that I despise or I didn't like, you know, from that competitive edge, sure. but we would talk on the phone. Like, yeah. And we would share information and we would like say, this is going on. And I find it so funny. Like just in this organization that's here in town, like everything's a secret. 
you know, like something new happens from this age to this age. And it's like, why are we not yeah. sharing information? And when I, yeah. you mentioned I coached with Clark at Western, the same sort of thing. Like you'd sit down with the other staff and you'd share, like you can watch a video. You can figure out what somebody's power play is pretty quickly. Like yeah. It's not a secret. Right. Know? But just like sharing information or how do you do this? Or here's some interesting drills. Like I think like, so that's hockey or whatever it is in life, but just being open-minded to like new experiences and different things. And yeah. I think that that's and just to your point, like if, like taking a little bit of criticism sometimes, like it's okay. Like you don't have to claim that you're an expert in everything. And I think as soon as you do that, then that's your downfall. I totally, I totally agree. And I think the other thing with that is being a student, right? Like I'm, yeah, I do skills. I'm a skills coach. That's fine. But I'm, I'm a student. I learn all the time. And I always say if I, when I stop learning, I'm done. Yeah. Right. If I'm not open-minded to like learning new things. And even like, I think a lot of that has to do with ego. We all have a bit of ego. I remember when I first was young in this business, I was very much like elbows oh, yeah. up and trying to, you know, I remember, now. I remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but now like I'll share anything. Yeah. What do you want to know? Like how we do this? How we do that? Like, what do you want to know? Like, and I love talking to other skills coaches or other coaches, hockey coaches that and I'll learn stuff from them on whatever it is. And I think the more you share and collaborate, the better I'm going to be. Yeah. Hopefully the better they are. And at the end of the day, who, who are we impacting? We're right. impacting the kids. Exactly. And I that's, think that's what gets lost. Yeah. That's totally what gets lost. I think like you see like kind of, you know, there's politics involved. There is, you know, unfortunately. Um, yeah. I genuinely, from the bottom of my heart, really try and not play that card. Yeah. You know, I try, when we had kids, we try to take what we thought were the best 17 kids. I mean, the other thing that sucks about tryouts too is that you got a week or two to figure out a kid who's played for yeah. like eight years. Like the whole process is slightly flawed. Yeah. But just... um just like the whole like tryout process or where kids are going and their whole development. Like it's just, it's a challenge, but you just got to be open-minded to certain yeah. things and not be closed-minded like we were talking about. Yeah. I just think it's just a, it's a message that needs to get preached in, in hockey and minor hockey and like everything in life. I think as soon as you, like you said, as soon as you stop learning, then you're done. Yeah. And I think people like get caught up with, this is what I did at 18 or this is what I did at 22. And then you're going to live the rest of your life at 22 or right. 18. Like just yeah. constantly evolve. We had a conversation before this started just about like how freely information is out there. And we can talk about hockey, but like, you know, you can get any video now of any hockey player. You can like learn different skill drills or you can learn how to shoot. Like you can get anything totally, at the snap yeah. of your fingertips. Yeah. I think it's like we live in such a wicked time if you really genuinely want to learn something, whatever it happens to be, if it's coding or if it's yeah. hockey, or if it's playing the piano, like you can genuinely learn something as long as you're open to it. But I think people just kind of like get in this little bubble, they put their little blinders on and this is what they do. No, so. it's so true. And I think like, I don't know what it was like for you growing up, but I remember growing up and I, you know, for a certain part of my life, I thought my parents knew everything. Like they were just so smart, right? You ask them a question, they knew it, yeah. or they maybe bullshit you an answer, sure. but you then bought it. And now, like, with my kids, they'll ask me something, and I'm not 100% sure. I'm like, oh, I don't know. And then right away, like, let's ask Siri. Yeah. Google like, it. Hey, yeah. Google. It's crazy, right? And they're, like, they're young, but it's so true. Like, I don't know all the answers. Yeah. And, you know, we were joking, like, I don't know. I don't know stuff. I'll, just, I'll Google it right away, and I'll, I'll learn something on the spot, you know? And I think for, these, for our young kids, it's so much more accessible for them that they're going to be ahead of the curve on what we were at those ages, obviously, yeah. and, and probably more, you know, intellectual, a little more educated than we are on certain things, right? Yeah. Um, so for us as parents or coaches, we got to adapt and, and kind of evolve with this generation well, and how it's moving. You know? That brings to mind, like I thought, like when I first started, started coaching, you know, and I thought like a player's going to ask me something. What if I don't know the answer, right? Like what if I don't know what to do here? Yeah. Like I know what maybe I would do or, you know, like, but maybe that's not the right answer, right? And I was like, I kind of like thought about that like over and over about teaching it. And that was really about like getting kids to think about what are things you can do in this situation or that type of thing. Mm -hmm. I just think it's like, understanding things is just is so important and not knowing that you have all the answers yeah like, that was the big thing for me because like you'd ask a coach when you're growing up and then he'd tell you this is what you're supposed to do and yeah like, well maybe that's not what you're it's not bubble hockey yeah you know yeah. Like, there's, <laughs> yeah. like, there's like it's the game yeah. is the game has evolved and it's still yeah. evolving like it's it's crazy so i think there's some like some just it's so important it's such an important message but as a player how fun was it to have a coach that would have that dialogue with you like, let's say you're a forward and you're like, coach, I've dumped it in there or not. And and rather than be like, got to dump it in at the red line, you'd be like, well, listen, where was the D there? Well, the D was kind of far back. Well, if you could carry and get the blue, like having that conversation with a coach where he treated you like an equal a little yeah. bit, right? How nice was I, that? I don't know that you know? I got that very often, to be honest yeah. with you. Like our, like our generation. But I mean, like you were you were more like that with your players. I tried to be. Right? Yeah. Like and I tried to take everything that I genuinely loved from every coach yeah. that I had, like as a player and then things that I would like as a player, things that I thought would be valuable as a coach. I tried to like take pieces from everything yeah. that I learned from those experiences and then tried to do my best at what that was. And I think like when I came into minor midget, I was like, oh, I know everything about minor hockey. 
I didn't. Yeah. Like I didn't. Like, yeah. Let's be honest. But like over each year, and I think like the valuable thing of like the experience I got is I actually coached two teams a year for about eight years. So I got 16 years of coaching right. rammed into eight. But like you evolve as a coach. You learn so much. Like you, you read yeah. more. It's like it's not like just because I played hockey I can coach. Yeah. Like there's so – because you're teaching. Like it's teaching. It's communicating. And I think like what I loved about coaching the most was really – it wasn't about Monday night for me. It wasn't about like, hey – the game. This is the game. Yeah. You know, that we won yeah. the game. It's about like, where are these kids going to be when they're 18? And yeah. like, did I make a small impact on like their future? You know, did I, did I ruin them yeah. <laughs> <laughs> completely? Yeah. Or, you know, like, cause, cause no one's going to be talking about what happened on Monday night five years ago. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's really about like, did this player learn anything? Did he take anything away? And I think if you can do that. So, I mean, we've had some amazing kids play for us that are going on to do some phenomenal things. We have other kids that aren't doing phenomenal things in hockey. Yeah, but they're doing phenomenal things in other places, and still like I still communicate with those guys and just kind of keep in touch with them. I think that's really what I liked about coaching the most was just like kind of the whole mentorship side of it. For sure. And having a young coach, you know, like yourself, who wasn't super far removed from the game, um, and obviously up in the new age stuff. I think for the young kids, that's refreshing, man. Like that's yeah. I you know, think I still like just like you mentioned that you were young. Like I get like I'm like oh I'm not that no I'm not too much older than you guys, but like I am. <laughs> yeah, you're old. You're old. <laughs> yeah, you're like, old. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and they always stay 15 every year because. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're always the yeah, same they think same age. Yeah, yeah exactly yeah. yeah um before we end off though i want to talk to you a little bit about you got a, kind of an interesting take on branding and how some of these young kids especially the athletes let's say we look at the highest level nhl nba nfl things like that um you know you got these athletes now that are looking at themselves more as a brand and and trying to monetize let's be honest with with themselves which i think is great and but, you know, back in that trailer up a little bit or that truck up a little bit and looking at these younger kids and how they're using social media, how they're using, you know, branding and things like that. And, you know, you being an entrepreneur kind of in that space a little bit as far as just, you know, looking at how these players, male, female, whatever sport they're in, how are they impacting social media? How are they branding? And I think at the young ages, sometimes they use it as text messages. They use it as, you know, it's they're saying things that probably they shouldn't be saying. And, right. You know, how, you know, what kind of a message would you send to these young males and females that are starting to use social media? And, and basically, let's be honest, anytime you post stuff, you're kind of, that's you, that's re representing you, your family, right. your brand, right? Yeah, like, I mean, this is, this is a conversation you could probably talk about for too yeah. long, but I think that we'll use the hockey world just for the point of the podcast, but it's interesting because there's such a different dynamic with the different generations that are involved, whether it's like a scout who's been around the game for, you know, 30, 40 years yeah. versus a 15 year, year old that's coming up, right. Who's, who's grown up with Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and whatever. You've got this generation that completely doesn't understand it. Yeah, right? for and sure. I, and I know the message in minor midget was like, shut down your social media, like shut it down, yeah. close Facebook, close Twitter, because these guys are, you're an asset to their business. Like they're going to do as much research as they can on you and figure you out. So I think when I first started out too, I was kind of preaching that same message, like, Hey, shut it down. And it's probably the safest way to like, make sure that there's no picture of you yeah. doing something crazy. Um, but you touched on branding and I think that like, that's the way, like the way I see it anyway, like my perspective, that's the way everything's going. You know, when you look at athletes, like athletes are, they're marketable. And they make big dollars for these teams that they play for. They make big dollars for, you know, the companies they're endorsed by. I don't think that athletes do a good enough job just branding themselves, you know. And mm -hmm. it doesn't need to be that I have to post everything on Instagram. But you can create a brand about yourself and, you know, like that. Like Horvat, he's, his name is worth something. Yeah. Dowdy's name is worth something. Suzuki, who's coming up, like his name is worth something. And people are going to be doing everything they can to leverage those connections to like make their business be profitable. Sure. When in turn, like these guys are getting paid to do a specific sport. But I think that there's a way that they could even leverage their personal brand to help them monetize even further, I yeah. guess, essentially. So it's just like, it's a tricky one though, because I think that there's an art to it. You yeah. Know, like, you know, you're kind of in that world. And, like, yeah. you know, Gary V is a guy we talked about that kind of preaches that. And he's doing a lot of stuff with, you know, he's getting involved in like Vayner sports, yeah. like Vayner media, where they're representing like football players and helping them with their brands. And I think it's genius. Like, yeah. I think it's like, you know, even if I have a 15 year old kid who all of a sudden has 10,000 followers, well, he makes my OHL team that much more marketable because he's got eyeballs that yeah. people are looking at. So I think that. The, like, I don't think that you're going to shut down social media. It's not going away. Right. So I think these teams that are still on this kick, like, hey, shut it down or do this. But I think at the same time, like, you have to be very mindful. Like, if I'm a player for the Knights and I'm posting stuff 
I'm now representing their brand. Right. So there's, there's the whole trickle yeah. effect, but yeah. you have to be, you have to be quite a clever on how you do it. But I think if you're smart enough, like it can actually, you know, really try to propel your career if you're, if well, you're good at it. A good example of that, I think, and this kind of happened probably five, six, seven years ago, but it's a guy like Paul Bissonnette played yeah. in the NHL, Arizona Coyotes, like obviously, you know, up and down kind of in and out of the lineup and, you know, played a decent number of games, I think over 400 games, like, you know, decent. Yeah. Um, but his, you know, his last couple of years of his career, he kind of hung on because of social media. Like I remember Arizona being, you know, at one point they get shut down his Twitter account because something happened and they were getting emails from fans being like, what's going on? Why did you guys shut him down? Where Arizona said, Hey, you got to get back online. You know, yeah. like he was, he was that impactful for the, for the crowd, for the, for the team. And then now, you know, he's got, obviously he's starting a good career in podcasting with spitting chicklets and things yeah. like that. But He's done a phenomenal job of like posting some fun stuff, some yeah, clever stuff, some, you know, some, some yeah, good he's a things. he's funny guy and he's kind of brought like what happens in the locker room out to the public. Totally. Thing. Yeah. And, you know, he chirps, he banters and like. And he's making money right now because of his brand, right? Yeah. And he started that while he's playing as an athlete and now it's kind of parlayed into. Yeah, because I mean, if you think about after. how many people had a very similar role to he did in hockey. Sure. Where, where are they today and what are they doing? Yeah. You know, and it's, it's not everybody, like, I mean, not everybody's going to come out and be amazing at that game yeah. and be able to spit out content and, you know, create a following. And it's getting harder and harder as like more platforms For evolve sure. and people are trying to get into that game. Yeah. Um, but I don't think it's really about chasing followers. I think yeah. it's genuinely just about putting out good content. Yeah. And, like people are going to be interested. And I think like if you follow the NBA at all, like they are killing it in terms of social media. Um, like I, you know, a third string NBA player is way more popular than Mike Trout. Really? Like eh? the biggest, you know, yeah. player in baseball. And, like, yeah. and what are they doing so differently than the other sports? Or what are these NBA players doing so differently? They're just oh, I think posting NBA, like, fun content. Yeah, like, or just... Well, NBA players have like a swagger. They have personalities. Yeah. You know, I think there's something to be said for that. They're interesting. They're fun to watch. Yeah. Like, you watch a hockey interview. It's like, it goes, well, like I said, and you know, we get pucks deep, sure. you know, like I said, and yeah. like, it's the same, like you could talk to 25 guys, they're all going to give you the same take. Yeah. Like they're not interesting. That's why I think why Bissonnette is so interesting to yeah. people because he talked, he, he spoke his mind. I think like you say what you want about PK Subban, you know, I think that he's, he's liked by a lot and he's not well liked by sure. several people. Right. Depending, yeah. But he, he's got a brand yeah. and like he's. He's so on that side of things, he's killing it. Yeah. And so I, it's the NBA, those guys just have a swagger, you know, they're kind of like in the hip hop culture too. And there's, you know, guys wearing different like clothing and style and different things. And maybe that's not part of hockey culture, um, but it's a part of your brand. Yeah. And I think like people, people want to see what you're like instead of just like on the field or, you know, like give us a little bit of like behind the scenes. For sure. Like, yeah. And I don't think you have yeah. to like really go into your whole private life. Yeah. I think like if you're an athlete, People know you as an athlete. I think genuinely that's what they care about. Like if I'm a Leaf fan, I genuinely care about like, you know, Marner and Matthews and those guys. I don't really care that they walk their dog at the park. Right. That doesn't interest me. Yeah. But like, you know, what are they doing behind the scenes? Like what are they doing to get ready? Because I'm cause the Leaf fan genuinely is going to focus on the Leaf players and what they're doing. So yeah. if players are putting out more content on just like, here's a workout, here's what I eat, here's how I'm getting ready for the game, or I'm hopping in the car, going to the game. Just anything to give that fan a little bit extra. They're working on their brand. And really, like, sports is awesome because they already have an audience. Yeah. Like, they genuinely, like, from the fourth line to the top line, like, those guys have an audience of people that like them. And Even the content's these, easy. because Super easy. Even these OHL yeah. kids. But instead, like, they choose to, like, post pictures of them cuddling with their girlfriend. Yeah. You know, and it's like, that's not what people <laughs> Piss want to off see. off half the fans. Yeah, like, yeah. don't. Like, or yeah. have a different account that's like for your buddies that's like kind of locked, but then have something that's like public that yeah. like you want to share to kind of create a brand. And I think that's the message that, I don't think kids know how to do it. You know, I don't think, I don't think 25 year old athletes know how to do it. I think there's like, there's a skill to it. It's a talent, like, and it's, it's getting harder and harder, but people are making a fortune on social media. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah. It's, and it's a, it's a world we didn't grow up with. Yeah, it's new, right? It's completely it's very new. new, yeah. Yeah, like it's yeah. new and it's not. But like, I mean, you know, Twitter's been around since, what, 2008, then Instagram came and like, you know, but people are just now kind of figuring out and navigating the waters on how they can put out content and create businesses yeah. and run businesses off of this kind of stuff. Like, it's, it's amazing. So I just, I'm super passionate because I have this idea of, you know, athletes and how, you know, because my whole kind of world growing up is mm -hmm. about being like an athlete and kind of navigating those waters. 
And you just see it and you study it more and more. And like, there's so much opportunity for these guys and they're just not taking advantage of it. Yeah. It's crazy, but it's going to happen. Yeah. I know it will. Yeah. yeah. But again, I think, you know, getting good mentorship on it and getting some direction on how to do it. Some of them are naturally good at it. They don't mind posting. Right. And but some guys and girls, it's uncomfortable to post certain things. Yeah. Right. Um, and if you are a professional athlete, you have all sorts of content, whether you're a tennis player behind the scenes, showing them in the locker room, getting their racket taped or their wrist, whatever it is. Right. Like, yeah. but fans do want to see that kind of stuff. And again, that builds your brand and kind of, yeah, I think the like, day. like, uh, I just got into F1 racing on the yeah. weekend. So they had the Australian Grand Prix. And so like Netflix actually has this special on F1 It kind of gets you to know the drivers, but this is the first year they have the youngest racing class in history but they actually talk about like in the documentary how like they want these drivers because they're marketable mm -hmm. so like you know they're good looking guys that are yeah. racing cars and then you know it's fast because so f1's really trying to push this you know they're trying to grow because they're they're falling off the map right sure. it's like gary v talks about this all the time where you know horse racing was super popular back in the day like, where is it today? Yeah. And now you've got esports that are taking off and people don't understand it. People are like, well, wow, somebody's playing video games. It's happening. Yeah. Like, you can, you can complain and bitch about it all you want, but, like, it's happening. And video games have been around forever. Just somebody's figured out a way to, like, connect the world and, like, now you can create these tournaments and esport events. And yeah. it's awesome. Like, and I they've think got it's great. crazy followers, too. Like, Huge. crazy like, amount of followers. They have crazy amount of followers and it's still unheard of. Mm -hmm. Like, you can talk to, you could probably talk to, 10 people today, have they heard of Twitch? Yeah. No one's going to have a clue what you're talking about. And it is a massive, massive platform that's yeah. out there where kids are playing video games on it. And like, there's people on there that have created a brand for themselves that are, you know, making a lot of money just playing video games, but they also have social content that they're putting out. I don't think it's about like snapping a selfie. Like right. I'm, I'm no, the I last agree. guy that's I just agree. like, hey, go pose in front of this. Like, yeah. I'm a big believer in like putting your technology away. Like I yeah. think people are addicted to their technology. And it's funny because that's the kind of world I work in now. But like put that stuff away, like be a human being, like interact with people. Mm -hmm. But like it's okay to just kind of have something. It doesn't have to be this perfect freaking photo. Just like put out content. If you're an athlete, you're trying to create a brand. Yeah. I just think that like it can actually you can use it to leverage things. I yeah. think it's it's just powerful. Yeah. No, I definitely agree. And I think for a lot of the athletes, their shelf life might be eight years, five years, 12 yeah, years, lucky, lucky yeah. 18, 20 years, right? But after that, what do you do? You're 40 years old. Now what do you do, right? And if you have that brand built up at 20 years old and you start, now you got totally. 15 years of your pro career and, and following, I mean, you could definitely make a living after, yeah, you know, after I think sport just on that. It's funny because you're talking about like this pro world, like you got a guy who's, you know, 28 years old, maybe who's in the league, been in the league for, you know, six, eight, 10 years, however long. He, that like social media wasn't a big part of his life when he entered the league. Right. However, you've got these young kids that are coming up that are 18, 19. It's all they've done for the last decade. Right. So like that wave is coming in. They kind of, they have a better understanding of it. And like we just talked about, they really don't know, but they're posting content. Yeah. Good or bad. They're posting stuff out there and they're just like probably inexperienced of being young. Right. You're just putting out stuff that you probably shouldn't put out there to the world. Yeah. Um, but I think that older generation hasn't really capitalized on what they could do because those are the ones that have the most powerful brand. Like they're the teams are making money because you're you're playing for them. But how are you, you know, capitalizing on that yeah. last name that's on your and it's such a fine line because I don't think you should be playing for the last name on your jersey. Right. You know, you should be playing for that crest, you should be playing for the team. Yeah. But you talked about the longevity of it. And I think like hockey is such a and I'm sure football and baseball are like this, but like when you're done. It's tough. Like, what do you do? What yeah. do you fall back on? Like, you know, and you get guys that just like get into some pretty dark places. And I think that if you kind of have a game plan for like mapping your future or thinking about different ways, and to your point, you can absolutely kind of create opportunities for yourselves inside of the sports world. You can't play forever, yeah. but you can kind of navigate those waters. And I think, you know, your example of Biz is a pretty great example of a guy who's, you know, taken something and then yeah in his career now it's yeah just, you know, he'll be around for a long time for sure yeah, yeah no exactly no it's a, it's such a for me too like i'm obviously i'm behind the curve a little bit on this stuff but learning as we go uh but it's fascinating and you know my kids will be growing up on social media and devices and all that kind of stuff that we weren't that we didn't grow up on so for me as a parent again adapting and, and evolving and figuring out okay how do we deal with this and how do we you know yeah. how do we but i think like like this is a perfect example of you adapting like yeah, you weren't doing podcasts two years ago. No, for sure. Right? Like, yeah, nobody was. Like, yeah, what's a podcast? Like, <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah. So I think yeah. like it's just like you're you're actually taking 
an opportunity and doing something with it. And you're sharing content and talking to people about hockey or life or whatever it is. And yeah. people can choose to listen to it or not to, but it's like you're, you're giving out information to people and they're not paying for it. And it's, it's incredible. And I think that, but people won't take advantage of the knowledge that you're throwing out there or what anybody throws yeah. out there. Like there's just only so many people that will actually like take it and run with it. Everybody yeah, I know for sure. Like, right? oh, this is what it is. But yeah. I think like, st- I think podcasts are amazing. I yeah. think that's like, there's so much information out there and, you know, there's different people that you can listen to, but like you get interesting guests, you get in, you can listen to this nonstop. Like, I think like, don't get caught up in just playing video games all day or reading the newspaper. Like there's so much information. Like it's, it's overload information. I, totally like, I don't even agree. know where to go anymore. Yeah. Cause there's so much. Information. It is too much sometimes. I agree. And I think like how I got into this was exactly that. I used to listen, I listen to podcasts still all the time. Yeah. Like if I'm working out or walking or running, like I'm listening to a podcast, like, or some kind of audiobook or something. Right. Sure. I just feel, I love music. Don't get me wrong. But I also like music to me, I'm not going to, I'm not going to gain much on music aside from a good feeling yeah. where if I'm listening to a podcast or I'm listening to an audiobook, I'm going to gain some knowledge on something. Right. Sure. Um, mm-hmm. And then this, I, you know, uh, meeting with cool people that I know a little bit or people that I've gotten recommended to that have a cool path that have kind of taken them down, maybe not making the NHL, but that have taken them down or older, they're still tapped in. They're still involved. You know, you're doing some cool stuff with Drew Dowdy and his family with the hockey tournament here, which is awesome. You know, you're, 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 not, you're an entrepreneur. You're, you're on, on that whole side of it as well, trying to create a business. Like, it's just, you know, you've, you maybe didn't make the NHL, you know, and, you know, I know you hit your goal playing a Western, but yeah, maybe exactly. didn't. <laughs> yeah. <wasn't> trying, like. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you're still, you're, you know, you get up in the morning and you, and you enjoy what you do, you know, yeah. and I think that's a, that, that's a cool message in itself that, you're having fun, you're enjoying what you're doing. And, you know, to me, that's what I would love to see every kid be able to do, whether that's playing in the NHL or be on a broadcaster or yeah, do I think, a play-by-play. And I play. think that's such a cool message. And I think that, like, our generation growing up, like you, like, you wanted to be a doctor, you wanted to be a lawyer, you wanted to be a physiotherapist or a teacher, or whatever that happened to be. Well, like, that's not what we are. Yeah. Um, I just think it's, like, do what you love. You know, chase what you love, but like work hard at it. I think that's the, you know, that's what's given me the opportunity to do what I do and be an entrepreneur or try to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Um, Is it like, it's not like you wake up and don't do anything. Like you wake up and you're doing stuff around the clock until you basically go to sleep at night. However, you love what you do. Right. So if you're doing that, then that's, to me, that's the best path. Like I would, I would preach what I'm doing to anybody. Like, just like go after what you want, chase your dreams, but like, don't just expect that it's going to come to you. Yeah. Like you have to, just like in hockey, like we talked about earlier, like if someone's shooting pucks for an hour a day and I'm not, they're getting an hour better than me. And then the next day they're doing it, they're getting two hours better then three hours better. So like you have to do more and put in more time than anybody else. But then I think when you do that and you love what you're doing, you're probably going to be successful. At yeah. It. No, it's great for sure, man. Yeah. yeah. Listen, buddy, I want to thank you a lot for coming by. It was great. Yeah, um, thanks for having me. And uh, we'll have to catch up with you when you get your uh, your stuff launched and, and out, and we'll try to yeah, I'd love to talk have another one to dissect sure. it. That'd be awesome. All right, buddy, thanks, man. Thanks, man. All right.